This lesson on hazard analysis starts with a story about a cute puppy named Clark. In the days leading up to the recording of this video, my wife and I were dog sitting Clark for our friends who were on vacation in St. Martin, which is in the Caribbean. The magnitude of this responsibility hit me when I was getting ready to take Clark on a run with me the second day we had him. Initially, I was okay with responsibilities such as feeding Clark and making sure he was getting enough water to drink. But when I got ready to take him on my running route, I started to feel nervous. This running route is a loop through downtown Raleigh that winds around museums, hotels, parks, theaters, restaurants, and the Capitol building. This running route is far from a walk in the woods. It exposes you to some busy intersections and lots of people. As Clark and I set out to go on this four mile run, I realized that there were several hazards we needed to be aware of. What if Clark got too excited and bit someone while we were downtown? Clark is your typical puppy going through the teething phase, so he is a friendly biter. What makes this worse is he has not been vaccinated for rabies yet, so this could be a public health hazard. Also, what if Clark became ill from dehydration? Or what if I accidentally stepped on Clark? Or what if I lost control of Clark's leash and Clark ran off and accidentally got ran over? I would feel horrible. In the end, Clark and I both got home from our run with no troubles whatsoever. And when I got home, I realized this was a good story to tell in which we could apply the first principle of HACCP, which is hazard analysis. After studying this lesson, you should be able to accomplish the following learning outcomes. Justify the importance of a complete and accurate hazard analysis and conduct a hazard analysis on a product and its process and document the results. According to the National Advisory Committee on Microbiological Criteria for Foods, there are three objectives to the hazard analysis. One, identify hazards that are reasonably likely to occur and their associated control measures. Two, identify needed modifications to a process or product so product safety is further assured or improved. And three, provide a basis for determining critical control points in the HACCP plan. Did I complete each of these objectives while running with Clark? To an extent, yes, I identified some hazards that were reasonably likely to occur. For example, possibilities of Clark getting ran over or of him biting someone. Yes, I made some modifications aimed at assuring safety in the situation. For example, I kept a tighter leash when I ran with Clark than I normally would when I'm running. However, I wouldn't say that I provided a basis for determining critical points to control during my run with Clark. My approach was only based on my ideas of how to mitigate the hazards that came to mind in the heat of the moment. By no means was I applying the five steps of hazard analysis. There are five steps in conducting a hazard analysis. As you know, what makes HACCP unique is that it adopts a systematic approach towards safety. These five steps are part of this HACCP system. As I read through these five steps, use the story I told you to determine whether I completed each of them before going on my run with Clark. These steps include the following. One, identify potential food safety hazards that may occur in the system for each step in the process. Two, evaluate whether the potential hazard is likely to occur in the presence of properly applied prerequisite programs. 3. Justify your decision. 4. Identify control measures that may control hazards that are reasonably likely to occur. And 5. Document each step. A complete and accurate hazard analysis is the basis of the HACCP plan. But to be honest with you, I hardly completed the first of these two hazard analysis steps when going on a run with Clark. Yes, I listed some potential hazards. And yes, I evaluated whether these hazards were likely to occur in the presence of prerequisite programs. For example, keeping a tight leash could be considered a prerequisite program. However, the extent to which I justified my decision was pretty low. Furthermore, I only spent a few seconds on step four, which involves identifying effective control measures, and I did not even consider step five at all, which involves documenting each of these steps. 
So let's dive into the five steps of hazard analysis. We almost need to begin with the last step, which is documenting each step. And this is for two reasons. One, the hazard analysis worksheet, or document, guides the first four steps in hazard analysis. The second reason is that placing high value on this hazard analysis summary document is a good practice since this document is a focal point of audits and inspections of HACCP systems. Typically, the processor will choose to collect supporting documentation for the decisions made on the summary form and keeps these documents close by. Let's go back to the first step in hazard analysis. In order to identify potential food safety hazards, we need to focus on the first two columns in this worksheet. In the first column, the process steps from a verified flow diagram will be listed. Each ingredient addition step or process step must be listed. Each step from the flow chart must be examined to determine if there are any potential hazards that occur that are introduced or that are increased at that step. Let's use a Frankfurter process as an example. Now we need to identify potential hazards. A hazard is a biological, chemical, or physical agent which is likely to cause illness or injury in the absence of its control. At this point, the objective is to produce a list of potential hazards for evaluation. Useful resources for identifying potential hazards are the various hazard guides which have been developed by different agencies and commodity groups. These lists of potential hazards are likely to be refined for individual food categories as risk analyses are developed in these foods. In this example, I used a guide to come up with these potential hazards. The biological hazards are contamination from Salmonella or Trichinae. Chemical hazards are therapeutic drug residues left over from the diet of the animals that were harvested. And physical hazards consist of foreign materials such as broken bone pieces. After potential hazards are identified, the team moves into the evaluation phase to determine if the hazard is reasonably likely to occur. A food safety hazard that is reasonably likely to occur is one for which a prudent processing establishment would establish controls or prerequisite programs for any of the following reasons. It has historically occurred, experience illness data, scientific reports, or other information provides a basis to conclude that there is reasonable possibility that the hazard will occur. Or there is a possibility that it will occur in the particular type of food that is being processed. At this point, the occurrence of the hazard should be considered in the presence of properly applied prerequisite programs. For instance, there is nothing in the process up to this point which will reduce the likelihood of occurrence of salmonella because it occurs on a large percentage of carcasses. Chicken A, on the other hand, is unlikely to occur because the plant is buying from a chicken A free certified production facility. Also, the presence of therapeutic drug residues is unlikely to occur because of government screening procedures that look for these residues. Raw meat ingredients come to us from a HACCP regulated plant which has metal detection in its HACCP plan. To complete the form, we note the answers to the question of reasonable likelihood of occurrence. We will need to justify the decisions we make at this step. Be sure to note the presence and location of any prerequisite program that impacts your decision. To complete the form, we note the answers to the question of reasonable likelihood of occurrence. We will need to justify the decisions we made at this step. Be sure to note the presence and location of any prerequisite program that impacts your decision. Once a decision has been made that a hazard is reasonably likely to occur and must be controlled by the HACCP plan, a control measure must be identified. Note that FSIS uses the term preventive measure rather than control measure. The older terminology was in use when FSIS wrote the regulations, but the term control measure is in current usage. Control measures are actions or activities that will be applied at a specific point to prevent, eliminate, or reduce the hazard to a safe level.
I want to take this opportunity to clarify some terminology. What is the difference between prerequisite programs and control measures? At first glance, they may appear to be very similar. Remember that a prerequisite program reduces the likelihood of occurrence of a hazard while the application of a control measure will prevent it, eliminate it, or reduce it to a safe level. In the example we're using in this video, prerequisite programs are things like purchase specifications, a regulatory testing program, and the receiving of raw meat from a HACCP plant. These only reduce the likelihood of occurrence of a hazard. However, the cook step kills salmonella, thus eliminating the hazard in the product. A food safety hazard that is likely to occur can only be controlled by a control measure applied at a particular step. To further complicate things, now we have a new term in food safety called preventive controls. This came into play with the signing of the Food Safety Modernization Act. What makes the term preventive controls so much different or better? Well, my opinion is that preventive controls are essentially the same thing as a control measure. They can be prerequisite programs or critical control points, as we'll talk about later in the class. Why do we have this new term? I think it's because previously a lot of companies, although they were effective at controlling critical control points, they were not as effective as at administering their prerequisite programs. So the focus was to introduce this new term preventive controls to emphasize the fact that prerequisite programs themselves should also be administered in a way that prevents the occurrence of a food safety hazard. To summarize this video, hazard analysis is part of what makes HACCP a systematic approach to food safety. We talked about the three objectives of hazard analysis, and then we walked through the five steps of hazard analysis step by step. This might seem like a lot right now, but in time, you'll become a pro at hazard analysis. We just need to get you some practice doing hazard analysis.